Living in the South Bay, residents may have noticed those small white domes atop the valley's hills. So you know, it's, it's very important that uh, it, it remain, it remain uh, open because it's so accessible to folks uh, in the Bay Area, relatively accessible. The drive up here is a little, a little bit uh, lengthy, but uh, it's certainly nice to have that uh, within uh, a day's drive. But what those small white domes have captured is anything but small. From small moons circling Jupiter to multiple planetary systems, and even helping the Apollo 11 astronauts accurately map the distance between the Earth and the Moon. We'll look at the importance that Lick Observatory still has in an area now known as Silicon Valley. High on top of Mount Hamilton is a place where many scientific breakthroughs were born. Silicon Valley residents see it from a distance, but few take that trip up that winding road to see it in person. Brenda Norrie begins our coverage by showing the rich history of Lick Observatory. The James Lick Observatory has been a Bay Area icon since the 19th century the first permanent mountaintop observatory in the world. James Lake was a wealthy man owning vast parts of the Bay Area during the gold rush. With his health declining and desire to perpetuate his family name, one sparked idea led to one of the most historic decisions of his life, building an observatory. You built a telescope, for example, that was bigger than anybody else's telescope it would be able to see things that nobody else could see, and therefore it would be making discoveries. And discoveries land your name in the history books. Lick's friend, who is president of the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, is credited with intriguing the millionaire with discussions about planets, rings of Saturn, and our moon's mountains. In his will, Lick provided for construction of the 36-inch Great Lick Refractor, it was worded such that build a telescope more powerful than any that exist. So that if whenever his will was executed, whether it be right away after he died or years after he died, they would look at that time at what the largest telescope in the world was and build one bigger than it. This refractor became the largest telescope in the world when it was completed in 1888. The best instrumentation made it superior to any telescopes of the time and soon found the fifth moon of Jupiter. The first four moons that had been known about uh, Jupiter had been discovered by a gentleman named Galileo in 1610. So from 1610 until 1892, every, all the generations of human beings during that time period had grown up, you know, aware that you know Jupiter had four moons it was kind of like the de facto number of moons that Jupiter had and suddenly you know this new telescope that's you know four years old and and with the best optics in the world uh, someone says no wait there's another moon and uh, it just kind of blew your everybody's expectations out of the water and just and, and uh, showed what a fantastic optical instrument this is. Discoveries encourage tourist visits from all over the world despite the five to six hour arduous trip up the mountain. Even today, visitors are in awe seeing the dome and telescope, and the road once traveled by horse-pulled carriages is now used as a joyride for classic cars and cyclists. Good workout, um, and obviously the view is spectacular up here. But the roads have definitely improved in recent times. Part of the agreement to build the observatory, James Lick, you know, wanted the city to, to you know, I, I, I'll put up the money for the observatory, you guys put up the money for the road, which shall be first class in every respect. Having driven the road, a lot of people would take issue with that, but it is a lot quicker than the six hour one lane dirt road carriage ride that it used to be. Now it's, it's actually paved and, and two lanes the whole way. That's actually comparatively recent. The road has invited visitors along the way, but even more intriguing are the programs Lick offers to the community. We also have additional programs, 
uh, during the summertime where you can buy tickets and come up and look through our historic 36 inch refractor and the 40 inch nickel telescope and hear science lectures and that and it's designed for a lay public you don't need to know anything about astronomy you'll have a wonderful time and look through some really fabulous telescopes and some really amazing objects the lick observatory is accessible to silicon valley which is perfect for introducing the sciences to future engineers doctors environmentalists and astronomers Lick never got to see his famous creation, but he is buried underneath the great historic contraption. The Lick Observatory invites the community to Music of the Spheres and the Summer Visitors Program. Visit their website at uclick.org and connect with them on Facebook and Twitter. When we come back, Brenda shows us why Silicon Valley scientists and engineers rely on Lick Observatory more than ever today. Stay with us. Silicon Valley boasts changing the world with its innovations and the Lick Observatory did just that when it had the first, most advanced telescope in the 19th century. We'll look further into why keeping the doors open to this observatory is relevant to inspiring people, advancing technology, and furthering creativity. Brenda Nori continues our coverage. Keeping the doors open to Lick Observatory is a passionate pursuit for some Silicon Valley scientists and visitors. I understand it was just, um, it was on the verge of closing, so I was aware of that situation. Very glad to hear that it's not, if nothing else, just because of the, the destination. And obviously, if you look around, there's a lot of people that like to come up here, and that would be a sad thing if that wasn't available to everybody. Tech company Google aims on making the world's information accessible. So by donating a $1 million gift to the observatory, it helped do just that. Silicon Valley's got, you know, it's the hub of innovation. And the technologies that, that get developed here are going to be things that, that these kids, you know, they're going to grow up with technologies that, that are going to be applied in space. And it's going to be almost second nature, a lot of this stuff. The observatory's historical scientific breakthroughs are continually available to visitors and residents. Astronomy excites young learners to explore using their own eyes and questions, but also it creates a drive toward other sciences. It's uh, very appealing to, to look at the skies and, and think about what's up there. But what's down here was in danger of closing the past few years. The observatory depends on funding from the University of California and donors. Google's million dollar gift came just in time. So you know it's, it's very important that uh, it, it remain, it remain uh, open because it's so accessible to folks uh, in the Bay Area, relatively accessible. The drive up here is a, a little bit uh, lengthy, but uh, it's certainly nice to have that uh, within a, a day's drive. The educational experience of Lick is not reserved just for kids. Got to take a tour of the observatory, which also took an hour, but it was very educational. When we come back, we'll be joined by a panel of renowned scientists discussing the relevance of astronomy today. Welcome back to this edition of Equal Time. Today we're going to look at the Lick Observatory and the importance to our society. Let's meet our guests. Hi, I'm Aaron Romanowski. I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at San Jose State University. I'm Alex Filipenko. I'm a professor of astronomy at the University of California, Berkeley. I'm Richard Vo, grad student at San Francisco State University. I'm Beth Johnson. I'm a physics undergraduate here at San Jose State University. I'm Brenda Nori, and I'm the student correspondent for this story. 
thank you all for being here today. Thank you for coming down to be a part of this. I think thank it's you. great. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're more than welcome. I, I think it's important that we've gone back to the time where we're thinking about what's out there. Oh. And we want to care yeah. about it. And we want to get there. And we want to try to understand what's going to be there when we get there. Right. What's taking us so long to get back to this? Well, you know, this is really the study of our origins. And people have this innate curiosity about the universe. But for some reason, there hasn't been enough emphasis on it in schools. Mm -hmm. And what the press now does with the Hubble Space Telescope and other observatories is really great. They're bringing the cosmos back to the kids. And Good. I like to say that astronomy is like the gateway science. It gets kids interested in science and technology. Then they go on in fields that are more immediately useful to society. Wouldn't you love to have science teachers like that all the time? Absolutely. Get you excited, make you want to go. But talk to me, Aaron, about the notion of students actually grasping the importance of this. Well, I think it's a fundamental human uh, interest in the universe, the world around us. When you grow up, you want to explore the universe, um, explore the world around you. And, and seeing the night sky, if you can get out to a dark area, when San Jose, if you're immediately in the city, you don't see the night sky. But if you can get a little bit farther outside the city, you just it just strikes you immediately, the immensity, the beauty of the universe. And I think people naturally want to, want to explore that and find out more. And what's amazing is that through all our technology today, we've We've made huge strides in seeing what's out there that our ancestors never knew about. And Beth, you share that thought? Absolutely. I, I've been into astronomy since I was a very little kid when my foster brother gave me a telescope. My dad took, set it up and I looked up at Saturn and I, I couldn't believe that what I was seeing was Saturn with the rings and everything and it was just so amazing to me that it, I've, I've had that my whole life and so I've instilled it in my child as well. So his first drawings were of planets along his wall and he did them all in order. And so it's, it's really important to me to keep that going. So you see parents, that is important. Sometimes that decoration will open the mind, you never know. I remember growing up in the 60s, Richard, uh, with the Mercury program and the Gemini program and Apollo and landing on the moon. And it seemed like, wow, what a quest to be going after in the future. I'm glad to see young people are more interested in this. Well, you know, I don't really see um, things like that every day. I normally see the new technologies coming out or the new just fun fab or just mainly lies in entertainment but you know we need a lot uh, I really focus on just what's really out there because as a physicist as someone and that cares in science you have to be curious about what's going on out there and me every night I just love looking at the night sky and seeing the lake observatory up there and it's just another sign that I can actually, you know, grasp what you can really see over, uh, I'm sorry. Um, but you can appreciate that, yeah. the cosmos in a very unique way. Yes. Very good. Yeah. yeah, because the next thing you see after the night sky is how can you really see further in the night sky? And the next thing you really want to look at is a telescope. And seeing the Lick Observatory is like a giant telescope. And that's mm -hmm. what I saw every day growing up in San Jose. Just. Yeah, yeah, same here. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Pretty uh, iconic for Bay Area. Yeah. You know, you grew up seeing those little white domes up there, and you get up there, and it's just really big. Yeah. And Have you ever been up amazing. to? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. Th th those are not mushrooms growing <laughs> out of <laughs> Hamilton, okay? Those are telescope domes with real telescopes that have made real discoveries, and we love using them, and we also love sharing our discoveries with the general public. And when you get the information back, we wonder, how long does it take you to discover something new? as opposed to reaffirm something you already knew? Well, you know, it really depends on the project. Sometimes you get this eureka moment, right, when you mm -hmm. see something that's clearly new. I mean, it's a little bit like my view of Saturn when I yeah. was a kid. Right. But more often than not, it takes, you know, years of analysis, or mm -hmm. at least many months of analysis. So, you know, for example, discovering the accelerating expansion of the universe, which we did in the late 1990s, took years of analysis. That's right, it, but, but it's worth it because of the inventions and all of the possibilities that come after. Go ahead. Yeah, and it, well, astronomy in particular is really fun. There's a, there's a balance between a long projects that take a long time and really fast discoveries. In fact, Richard was at the mm -hmm. telescope. You mentioned that this expansion of the universe makes use of supernovas, and Richard discovered a supernova while he was at the telescope. And, oh, awesome. Uh, he yeah. Sort of a on the <laughs> it was a eureka moment. It just, you know, we looked, at the, we looked at a past picture, and we looked at the new picture. It's like, something's not there. And yeah. seeing through a telescope, right away, li live time, it was just... Well, I mean, and, and in fact, the, yeah. the exploding stars, the supernovae, yeah. are what allowed us to finally evolve, right? I mean, yeah. the heavy elements in your body, you know, the carbon in your cells, the oxygen that you breathe, the calcium in your bones, the iron in your red blood cells, were created through <laughs> nuclear reactions in stars and expelled by these exploding stars. And so if it were not for 
the fact that some stars explode, we wouldn't be here discussing this, exactly. you know? Yeah. Right into the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Talk to us more, Brenda. You, you had this idea to do this story. Why? Um, I just felt like you lost, a lot of kids growing up now kind of lost that curiosity and becoming an astronaut, you know, a lot of them want to be singers or actors, which is fine, but when I was growing up, I remember seeing um, Space Camp being advertised on TV, and like, I want to do that, and, uh, I, you know, you just don't really see that now, and with all the technology coming in, I think it's a great time to start being curious and expanding on that. When's the best time to enjoy the Lick Observatory, from the public's perspective? Well, we have a... Um, we have visiting hours throughout the year, but in the summers especially, we have Friday and Saturday, Saturday night viewing programs where you get to hear a lecture by an astronomer and look through the great historic 36-inch refractor, and on some weekends even um, you know, hear a concert. We have concert performances as part of this oh, Music of the Spheres program. Well, it's not while you're looking through the telescope. You know, you, you, you listen to the concert, and then you go Take and listen to a lecture or you know, view through the telescope but it's sort of music of the spheres, and so it's an all-in-one package, and it's a great thing for the public to enjoy. So those are Friday and Saturday nights, the visitors program and the music of the spheres program during the summers. Very good. And Beth, when you get students to go up there, or friends, or community people, uh, what do they come back telling you? They're always amazed by the, the view and the history. Um, I, I personally, when I went, got the whole spiel on the history of the telescope and the observatory and the area. And it really puts you in touch with the history of the valley, even, because that observatory is so important and Lick is so important to what, you know, what developed here. And to take friends and have them go up and get to see these huge telescopes, I mean, the, the opportunity to see something like that is so rare. And so they always come back just sort of almost overwhelmed with it. And then I've seen a friend, few friends have to take time to process what they've seen. But to get to look through the 36 inch and see Saturn in even more detail, and you know, the big comment I always hear is it looks like it's painted on. It looks yeah. like it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's unbelievable. And, and remember, this was the biggest telescope in the world mm -hmm. when it was completed in 1888. Yeah. Right. And it was the result of this generous gift by James Lick of $700,000 in 1875, which as a fraction of the GDP would be equivalent to $1.2 billion today. Wow. Yeah, that is a big donation. And that's a hell of a science project. <laughs> yeah, well, it was really, in a sense, the birth of big science, certainly in California, and one could argue even in the whole U.S. Well, absolutely. But look what it has changed, and as you said, the history. Uh, tell us more, Brenda. What else have you found out about this? Oh, well, I was going to say, just driving up there, the windy road, like, <laughs> that alone yeah. is history. <laughs> I mean, I, I believe the new road is over what was the road that was yeah. taken to yeah. build it, right. and so you mm -hmm. see pictures of them with these trucks, you're like, how did they drive that turn? Well, it was horse well, and carriage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's why it's exactly. not very, yeah, it's not very steep, so, but it's very windy because it follows the contours mm -hmm. of the mountain. Okay. Yeah. And, and I believe it was actually in uh, Lick's will that it had to be accessible by road, easily, yes. easily accessible <laughs> by road. A first road. class yeah. road. A first, first class road. road, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's what you've got there with its 365 plus or minus turns. You know? Exactly. <laughs> One for every day of the year. It's worth the trip, but when you're out there, Richard, what do you get out of it? Well, one thing I get out there is basically the view of the Bay Area. That's one thing I really enjoy. Another thing is just seeing how much more how much more clear the night sky is up there than it is where I am in South Bay, San Jose, where it's just yellow lights everywhere, which is the street lights. But just seeing that, seeing the night sky, just it's just beautiful. Oh, absolutely. It's beautiful. And how do you open up science? to young people today in your area of study, Aaron? Well, it's, it's great. Uh, you, from the youngest age, you can enjoy um, astronomy in particular. As you, as you mentioned, Alex, is sort of a gateway drug to science. And mm -hmm. you know, if I present to uh, say kindergarten classes, then the, the, stu the students are extremely engaged, and they're very bright. They have ways of engaging with the, the material, thinking about the universe. They have ideas about it. And um, that's sort of what we'd like to see them continue doing their whole lives, is having this, this kind of question of the universe and being able to engage with it, and astronomy is a good place to start for that. I had a teacher in college that once described it as, it's a catalyst for creative thinking, well, but also right. critical thinking. Yeah, yeah, critical thinking. Very important to develop those skills, you know, among the voting public. They've exactly. got to be able to evaluate things that are told to them and try to figure out, does this make sense, you know? Does this sound kind of strange? Is this logical? Yeah, is it this logical? Yeah. Sense yeah. And all that? So, you know, 
the kids get turned on by what we discover in the cosmos, and then they pursue fields in science and technology, and mm -hmm. they become you know, computer scientists and engineers and applied physicists. Some of them may become astrophysicists, but that's not really the point. We need only a small supply to replenish us. Exactly. It's really getting the kids interested in science and technology mm -hmm. overall, and that's something that astronomy does, and we're proud to open up Lick Observatory to the general public, mm -hmm. both our discoveries in the hallway exhibits and you know, viewing through the telescope and hearing lectures, that kind of thing. You know. very, very good, and I remember growing up listening to Walter Cronkite on CBS talking about the moon landing and all of that. Brenda, do you have anything in our world today, social media, traditional media, that inspires young people to think about this? I think the Pluto mission right now is pretty inspirational. Yeah. I mean, we're about to get close-up view of Pluto. Yeah, and New Horizons mission. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's very good. <laughs> and we just, you know, we live through Pluto, Pluto because, you know, Disney character Mickey <laughs> Mouse's yeah. dog's named yeah. Pluto, and yeah. I just wonder why they named it Pluto. But yeah. for all the yeah. third graders out there, there were good reasons yeah. to demote it yeah. from being a genuine <laughs> planet yeah. to a dwarf planet. And the and first of its kind, in a sense, yeah. right? In a right. sense, we promoted it to being the first dwarf planet. And, and my, my third grader, in fact, actually argues with me that Pluto should be a planet. So ah. he, he is one of those <laughs> that I have to have these arguments with. So yeah. he, Maybe. he is actually very passionate. Maybe because I'm young, I still believe Pluto needs to be a planet. <laughs> awesome. That's all right. I'm old and I believe it's a planet. So don't worry about it. But how do we get the, the, the next step, which is let's have more interest in space travel. Let's have more interest in how to develop rockets and opportunities to get out there. How do we, we make the next step using LIC, using other opportunities in science? Well, I think, uh, I think we're going to be there. We're just having a pause right now with the space shuttle program. I mean, when I was a kid, I was very much into the space shuttle program. Uh, it was a huge inspiration for me in pursuing a career in science. You know, and we're in a pause right now. We're developing the new program. Hopefully, when that comes back on board, that's going to be a new step in inspiration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, um, at places like Lick Observatory, in particular at Lick, we really um, encourage students to design their own projects and also mm -hmm. to build new instruments and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the kind of thing that can lead to advances in space exploration later on as well. New technology right now that we have is advanced. And especially working a telescope, working a giant telescope like Lick or something even bigger, the newer ones, it's really difficult to use. It's really not user friendly. It's mm -hmm. not like your average computer that you just type in and um, press, but it's just, Having Lick over there would help us just get fond of that tools really at an early level. Well, this is actually yeah. a very important point that, you know, um, most students cannot use the Hubble yeah. Space Telescope or the very mm -hmm. biggest telescopes like right. the Keck 10 meter yeah. telescopes in Hawaii because the time is so precious and yeah. they're just beginning to learn and so they tend to make more mistakes. You know, I make yeah. mistakes too, but they make more mistakes than I do. So giving them the opportunity to get their hands dirty with research and real data and data analysis and machines and things with the smaller, more accessible telescopes at Lick yeah. is a really, really important part sure. of their training. And we even give them a chance to be the lead, the principal investigator on projects that they design and execute and complete on their own with occasional kibitzing from me. This is what builds real independent leaders. That's excellent. Yeah. How about the math factor? We have people interested in this, well, they can be armchair astronomers. You know, I mean, I might not be good at biology, but I still enjoy reading about the great advances that are being made in the biomedical sciences and genetics and things like that. So you can read about the discoveries because astronomy is made so accessible to the general public. Exactly. And does it help to have the administration in Washington be pushing this more, or how? what have they done to make people more interested in wanting to go to Lick or wherever they are in the area? to study this, to look at the cosmos in a different way? Well, there are a number of public programs now. I mean, there are many, many more science and astronomy type programs, like the Universe Show that I'm on quite a bit, and mm -hmm. Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos, which was the remake of uh, Sagan's thing mm -hmm. from right. you know a long time ago. So he I think incredible. there is a lot more. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. the, he was incredible. Uh, you know, uh, Sagan was really one of a kind, you know, but I think Tyson's show is very good as well. Mm -hmm. And so there is much more attention to this kind of stuff uh, given to the general public now. Yeah. And more or less, are young people simply not aware of the open qualities of the mind by studying science? And what I mean by that is, when I was in school, science was one of those things that puzzled me, but excited me, but made me curious. And it led me down the road of journalism, but it also can lead you down the road of science. I think that, um, you know, for at least 
observing my own child is, is really where I have to come from uh, at this point. And he definitely has that curiosity. Um, but I do see in his class, you know, when I'm around other students, that it's, he's kind of alone in that. Um, they just started a science unit, in fact, uh, again, and it's, it's such a rarity that it's a treat. And I, I, that's a problem, I think, right off, that science has become a rarity in, the, in their school system. Right. But they are, you know, they've started with astronomy because, as you said, it is the kind of the gateway to the sciences. Yeah. And so they're all drawing planets and stars and comets and, and you know, they're getting into it and interested. And right. it is inspiring them. And I'm hoping that from here we start to see a little bit more of it well, each time. Yeah, I'm seeing some changes. For example, I recently obtained a very generous donation from Google uh, to support the research and public outreach we're doing at Lake. Is it $1 million? Uh, $1 million from Google, that's They're right. Nice. And uh, well, you know, in part one might say, you know, why would they do this? But they understand that the future of their company mm -hmm. depends to some degree on getting today's youth <laughs> excited mm -hmm. about science and technology. And so they want more people to go up to Lick. They want more undergrads to get their hands dirty with data. And so they want to support this kind of thing. And I'm hoping that other major high tech companies in Silicon Valley will follow suit. But you know, kudos to Google. They had the, the, the far reaching view to, to provide this support for us. And partnering with schools and programs, go ahead. I was gonna yeah. say, and that's a good idea that Lick um, mingles with music and astronomy because that's, you know, it gets people from who are interested in the music to come check it out and you get... Well, you we know. call it STEAM now, yeah. not just STEM. <laughs> right. We include the STEAM. A for <laughs> arts, like right, yeah. yeah, STEAM, science, yeah. technology, engineering, mm -hmm. art, and music, yeah, okay. and, uh, and math, yeah. Find a way to get Jay in there for journalism. Right, yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that counts as part of the arts, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> See, I'm trying here, I'm trying to get people back over to our program. Yeah. Listen, this has been wonderful. I do hope people go out and check this out. And we thank you for joining us for this edition of Equal Time.